Hello, welcome. This is the Crooked Paths, and my name is Marcelo. This is a short little talk about ancient cultures' deep wisdom. I've got over 33 years of personal experience studying psychology, and I'm a marriage and family therapist. So I've you know looked at the human condition quite deeply since my late teens, questioning life learning as much as I could in university. And I was fortunate enough when I was about 35 years old in the year 2000 to go deep into meditation, deep into yoga. I was living in India and in Nepal and I went into a program. I did one of those 10 day meditation retreats, the first of many, fortunately. And then I got into a yoga program up in a place called Rishikesh in North India at the base of the Ganges, where the Ganges, at the base of the Himalayas, excuse me, where the Ganges comes out of the Himalayas onto the plains of India. Really a beautiful place. And it's known as the yoga capital of the world. But anyways, the reason I mention all this is to set up the context of what this talks, talk is about. And basically... I got to do yoga for five months, almost, intensely. It was like five to seven hours a day of yoga, five to six days a week. And fortunately, I read a lot as well. So I just got a, there. You could get all these incredible books that are just not available in the West and dived into it. I love reading. And coming from a psychology background and having also studied literature, economics, anthropology, the sciences when I went to undergrad at UCLA. It was a very interesting contrast because what happened was that in the West, we grow up with this intellectual tradition where we study things, we parse them, we deconstruct them, we take them apart, we try to analyze things. And we think that by doing that, we're getting a deeper understanding of it. But there was a wise man who was explaining that, a wise man from India who was explaining that modern science will want to study the beauty of a flower. And so it'll take this flower and chop it up and put it, you know, even worse, put it into a blender and grind it all up, to, you know, find its components and all that. And in the process, they've destroyed the flower. <laughs> so, and beauty is not, well, you know what I'm meaning, you know why I bring that up, right? Okay, so basically, what I noticed from going deep into these ancient traditions was exactly what Albert Einstein had said, the brilliant, deeply wise, deep humanitarian that Albert Einstein was. He said, the ancients seem to have known something which we seem to have forgotten. The quote goes something like that. And when I was reading these ancient books about the Upanishads in India, for example. Specifically, one of them was called Yoga Vashishta, known as the Supreme Yoga. And what, it, I mean, it's a big work and there are really incredible stories, you know, reflecting on the nature of reality and what is this life and who are you and who do you think you are? You are much more than that and realizing how the, blinding effects of your ego, how it like restricts your sense of reality. You're looking at everything through the narrow chinks of, of a, a little chink in an opening into another room. So just like William Blake was saying as well. And I found that to be actually very profound and so true. And these works 
are ancient. The, the Yoga Vashishta, for example, is like more than 1,500 years old. They don't know where it actually came from. In the ancient traditions, it was an oral tradition, and it was perfectly preserved. It was so perfectly preserved that in a book called In Search of the Cradle of Civilization by George Feuerstein, Subhash Kak, and David Frawley, they were, these guys were describing how these ancient oral traditions, especially from India, were so perfectly preserved that only in a text of like texts of like that include millions of words, there's only a discrepancy, some sort of controversy over five or seven words. I mean, a minuscule amount compared to the total that exists. And these, I mean, that's out of millions of words, only a discrepancy of controversy with five or seven words. The fidelity of these ancient oral traditions that were eventually put down in written form, I think it was in the late 1800s, when the British, who were exploring the culture of India, they really asked for these secret teachings to be put down on paper and, and explained. Well, they were quite surprised when they found out that the, in these oral traditions, the maintainers of these oral tradition, traditions, the Brahmins, they would recite these things. They would train themselves to recite these things perfectly. And, but they didn't know what it meant. So the position of these guys who wrote In Search of the Cradle of Civilization was that these ancient works were more perfectly preserved than the three main pyramids on the Giza Plateau in, in Egypt, which are an astounding work of architecture built to a level of perfection, which modern architecture cannot even come close to. And this is mainstream archaeology will say, oh, but it's like these people who came out from the Neolithic times with stones and, and copper chisels who carved granite into such perfection. It's, it's all BS. It's an adult fairy tale. They are not tombs. They are not, they are older than the Egyptian culture. You go in there and there's no, there are no hieroglyphics in there. I was fortunate enough to go, it was a gift from my wife. She took me to Egypt early last year. To, it was a lifelong passion to visit these things. And yeah, there are no hieroglyphics in these things. And there are no bones ever discovered in these places. So they were not tombs. And spending an hour in the Great Pyramid in the King's Chamber. And I felt like an overcharged battery. Like I've said in other podcasts, for five days, I could barely sleep three hours. It was... It leads me to the conclusion that it is some sort of consciousness machine, these these incredible structures. But that's that's another podcast. So looking at the ancient teachings of the Upanishads, and you could see also in the ancient teachings from China, like uh, Taoism, what Lao Tzu taught, they are profound. They go deep into the question of who are we? Where are we? What is the nature of this existence? And coming from a psychology background that got exposed to science over 30 years ago, as I said, I started realizing that these ancient people know much more than the modern world. You may be shocked by this. You may say, no, that's not just not possible. Yes, of course, that's your opinion. That's fine. But from what I experienced and what I got to read and what I and going deep into this inner journey to experience what I knew intellectually, that everything is made up of atoms that are vibrating at billions of times per second you know, with the electrons spinning around the pro proton and the neutron. 
at near the speed of light. So you to to actually experience these things, to see these things within oneself. And this is what the ancients were all about. They were about experiential wisdom, not intellectual wisdom, which is just conjecturing and pontificating on on points and th thought models, thought experiments, as they say in, in philosophy. It was much deeper than that. It was actually having a, an experience of these things. So in modern science, which is which psychology and psychiatry pride itself on being based on scientific research, a scientific foundation. In modern science, there's a hard question. And the hard question is, what is consciousness? And it's a hard question because they haven't been able to scratch the surface of this thing at all. Barely, if at all. And the reason has to be because in science you have to be very objective. So you, the human component is removed from the scientific experiences, experiments. And in consciousness, in the exploration of consciousness as done by the ancients, they did no such thing. They went deep into themselves, explored their inner reality, and there was, they would, the ancients who transcended the ego would share this knowledge with each other. And hence you have the Upanishads, you have Vedanta, you have Zen, Buddhism, you have the Buddha's teachings, of course. My God, that guy was amazing. Deserves, he, if, he, if he was alive today, he would deserve every Nobel Prize I was ever given. What he discovered was so profound. And so, so what, what and the ancient Egyptians too, what they were describing in their, in their ancient works, if you, just, if you go into it, remarkable, just remarkable. Contrast that to uh, what they said was that the only thing that does exist is consciousness. So contrast that with modern science, which has nothing to say about consciousness. But in modern science, you do have the cutting edge, which is quantum physics. And in quantum physics, one of the founders of quantum physics, Schrodinger, after all his work, all his theoretical explorations of the nature of reality via con you know, quantum physics, he said the total number of, the, of minds in the universe is one. One, cap written in capital letters. And there was a lecture, it was a discussion on stage done with the physicist Tyson deGrasse and another physicist named Gates and, on a, and some others. And on that stage, Tyson deGrasse was asking some questions of this theoretical physicist named Gates, who was, who had for like the last 15 years been working on equations having to do with string theory. And string theory is one of the theories about, the, you know, from physics, from theoretical physics about what is reality. And this guy Gates, the, the physicist, he was describing how he came upon the most crazy thing you can imagine in his in the theoretical equations of reality in string theory. He found algorithms in the equations. And not just regular algorithms for mathematics, but algorithms that were of the same nature as the algorithms used in search engines for the internet to, to surf the world, the world wide web. And these are very specific and unusual algorithms. So, and his conclusion, he said this on stage to Tyson deGrasse, was that if he was, if he had created a simulated reality, like in the movie The Matrix, if he had created a simulated reality, 
he would leave some clues for anyone trying to explore the meaning, the, 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 the threads that make up this simulated reality. And the clues that he would leave would be something like that, which, which led him to the conclusion, the very uncomfortable conclusion, that we are living in a simulated reality, in a Matrix reality, like the movie The Matrix. If you haven't seen the trilogy, watch them. You're very lucky you get to see them for the first time. I, I've seen them, each one, over 50 times. They're, they're so profound. They were, they were talked about in philosophy classes all over the world after the first one came out, and the second and third, deeper and deeper. So... So what does this have to do with the, this, the ancient cultures and deep wisdom? The deep wisdom of these cultures, and this is also from shared in the American Indian tradition with the Aborigines of Australia, these ancient cultures. It's shared with the shaman traditions that are all over the world. And just as a side note with the shaman traditions, they were, they are so ancient. And there are shaman traditions, unfortunately, that have disappeared. But they are so ancient and modern anthropology and archaeology has dated them to more than 10, 20, 30,000 years old. And the Aborigines in Australia have been estimated to have lived in Australia till, um, you know, as long as goes 60,000 years ago. And these peoples were so deeply rooted into the land, into nature. They were in a very deeply symbiotic connection, relationship with nature. And you look at the great teachers, Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, they all talk about the importance of spending time in nature. So in the, with the shamanic, shamanistic traditions, these cultures that were so sparsely disconnected from each other, you know, they lived, they were isolated. They were separated by the ice age, you know, so they couldn't connect with each other at those times, 20,000 years ago. Think about it. It's remarkable. They all were so coming from such different cultures but the conclusions from all these widely various cultures, the shamanistic conclusions were the same, that we are living, that our world, <laughs> this is, you won't believe this, but they say that our world is a dream world, that we really don't exist. And quantum physics is talking about the same thing. It's questioning this reality. And modern physics for the last 120 years has known that we're made up of atoms and what is the nature of an atom? The electrons spinning around the proton and the neutron at near the speed of light, that they're vibrating constantly and that there is a gigantic amount of empty space in the atom. And you look out at outer space and there's an amazing amount of empty space in outer space as well. So going deep into the micro, the quantum, even going into your own body, your own body, there is so much empty space that it is the craziest thing. It's very similar to the empty space in outer space. And then you get down into string theory or um, what was it? The another theory about how there's parallel universes. And they're, they're like on, in modern physics, they're like cutting edge. It's like there might be like 11, 12, 13, 20 parallel universes. Well, the Buddha talked about this and he said there are endless, infinite parallel universes. And I would, I, my intuition is that go with those guys. They're, they really knew what they're talking about because they were talking from personal experience. So in the modern world, you look at what's happening. People have thrown out religions. And 
completely understandable. There's a lot of superstition in religions. There's a lot of control and super and, and superstitiousness in religions. I was brought up as an atheist. And my parent, which was very unusual since both my parents were South American, they came from Chile, and but fortunately they were both artists as well. So I grew up with an atheistic perspective on things and was very proud of it in university 30 plus years ago at UCLA, as I said. But there's an arrogance to, to being an atheist and there's a blindness to being an atheist. And what I've realized over time is that... There is no such thing as an atheist. Everyone believes in something. And what I, I really wasn't an atheist. I, what I believed in was nature, the incredible deep intelligence of nature, of mother nature. That for me was my temple, I would say. And with the religions, what people are sort of missing when they, when they're, you know, when they discard it, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, unfortunately. Because in the center of every single religion is a deeply mystical experience, a deep exploration of the nature of reality of who we are. And that's what Socrates did. I mean, he wasn't connected to any religion except, of course, Greek mythology, which was their religion, which was not a mythology, really. So, but even Socrates was, you know, he, he wasn't so, con it doesn't seem like he was, and Plato, they were not so concerned about those things. They believed about giving offerings to the gods on Mount Olympus, but you know they, they were more about exploring reality right here, right now. But in the modern world, the baby has been thrown out with the ba with the wa bath water, as the expression goes, because the center of all religions is the deep mystical experience, and the deep mystical experience is what is pointed at in shamanism, and what is pointed at in ancient India, ancient China, ancient Egypt, and ancient Mesopotamia. So that's, and you look at the modern existence for people, and people unfortunately seem to be in a state of deep impoverishment. It's as if the modern world doesn't give something of meaning to people to pursue. And perhaps in the scheme of things, it's all perfect. You know, you see a lot of people just now with, with smart technology, with the smartphones, with the computers, with the internet, just having their, walking down the street and having their heads, you know, dug down into the, into their smartphones. And the internet is a fantastic thing. I, I think it's wonderful. I think it's revolutionary in the best sense of the word revolutionary in terms of sparking people's imaginations, sparking people's curiosities, and exposing bullshit right off the bat. So, and exposing deception as well. The deception of the mainstream media, for example, over the masses. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. But then what happens? What happens as a result of this? One can, a modern citizen can become despondent can feel that everything is fake and then lose faith even in life. What's the point of living when we get to that? Well, the, there, if, if we can go to the ancient traditions before religions, before religious thought, you can see that the ancient people had much more free time on their hands. You know, they, if you're an agriculturalist, you're farming the land, you... You do your work in the season, and then the rest of the time, you're waiting for things to grow. So you have much more free time on your hands. Second, they had no light pollution. So they could look, they saw the stars above their heads. They were really moved by this whole thing. They were incredible observers of astronomy. They called the planets. They noticed that the planets were wandering in their movement around around in the sky and so in planets in ancient Greek is means wanderers so they knew that there was this connection with above and the below they knew that they they knew that the Sun did not revolve around us you know that was that I remember seeing an episode of 
scientific of an astronomical episode on documentary and it was describing about this little knowledge that was kept from the library of alexandria which had been burned down by religious fanatics and the masses the mobs the the, the mobs that are so easily incitable to do horrific things to everything and the the knowledge that was kept showed very clearly that they knew that it was the earth going around the sun, right? So, and you look at the ancient Mayas, you look at the ancient Egyptians, how with the new field of archaeoastronomy, how the ancient structures were built aligned to celestial events, like the rising of the star Sirius, for example or how the three main pyramids on the Giza Plateau are built on the configuration of the three stars of Orion's belt, for example. I mean, it's utterly incredible. So if they were able to build at such precision, they knew the reality of, of astronomy, that we're the ones going around the sun, that the, there's much more to the universe than just the sun, you know, there's galaxies. They had ancient deep wisdom. They even knew about the procession of the equinoxes, which is a 26,000-year-old cycle, which modern astronomy did not even know about till, you know, it, it, until very recently, you know, like the 1800s, I think it was. So with more and more powerful telescopes. So the procession of the equinox is 26,000 approximately year cycle. The ancient people knew about this stuff. So what was the, what was the conclusion of, of the ancient works? What was the conclusion of the ancient wisdom? It was that it's that this life is utterly incredible that there's a powerful blinding effect of our egos, okay? And that the only thing that exists is consciousness. They said anything that is changing is not real. I mean, think about that. Everything that is changing is not real. So you're sitting on a chair right now, perhaps, or you're walking somewhere. You feel the solidity of the earth underneath you, the cement, the asphalt, whatever you're standing on. And, but from an atomic level, it's mostly empty space. Even if you take a neutron star, which is one of the most dense materials there are in the physical universe as far as modern astronomy knows, a neutron star will only be like the size, you know, like 20 miles across, let's say, but it's made of compacted star material. It is so dense, a spoonful of this star material weighs more than a thousand trucks. A spoonful of this dense material would probably go right through the earth to the other side and then be brought back by the gravity through the other. It would just pierce holes through the earth to turn it into Swiss cheese, for example. That's like one theory. Neutron stars are spinning at huge velocities tens of thousands of times per second and emitting incredible bursts of energy. Uh, but anyways, but even a neutron star is mostly empty space. So they, so the ancients said, whatever is changing, like atoms are constantly vibrating, is not real. So look at your body. It's constantly changing. It's made up of cells. You're made up of 50 trillion cells in billions. Each cell is made up of billions of atoms and it's constantly changing. So according to the ancients, the ancient Indians specifically, they're saying we don't exist. They said the only thing that does exist is consciousness. And there was um, one of the most advanced Upanishads, again, the written tradition. And it's actually a very short Upanishad. It's called the Mandukya. Upanishad. It says, it's talking about the four states of reality. It says that you have the waking state, the sleep state, the dream state, 
And then you have a fourth state called the Turiya state. The Mandukya Upanishad is considered to be the most difficult teachings, the most advanced teachings, because it's talking about the nature of our reality in a very succinct way. And so these three states of this sleep state, the conscious state, and the deep sleep state, the, the, um, and the REM, rapid, um, the dream state, it's, uh, it's saying that the, the fourth state un underlies everything, the fourth state called the Turiya state, and that that is the foundation of reality. So they said that is consciousness and that consciousness is the foundation of reality and modern modern science remember mainstream modern science is saying that that is a hard question they don't they know nothing about consciousness whereas for the ancients they only cared about consciousness they explored it deeply they were their own labor you know physics laboratories going deep within themselves so 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 the point is you might find this disturbing or you might find this really interesting explore it explore it. go into quantum physics find videos of it on youtube go into read the ancient works read the ancient study the ancient the aborigines uh, when when I was in Australia, I th the, it was only very recent, it seemed like, that there was a deep appreciation of Aborigines. But there's, in general, you saw that that culture was deeply neglected, like the American Indian culture is in North America. And it seems like non-North Americans really have a deep respect for the American Indian traditions. Uh, that's what I've noticed in all my travels. And... It's it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because these ancient societies, the ancient American Indians, the ancient Aborigines, they knew so much. And the Aborigines, for example, said, it's part of their foundation of knowledge that they said, this is not the real world. This world that you and I are in, that you know, you're sitting or you're walking, wherever you are, you're in a park right now, whatever you are doing, is a dream reality like the movie the matrix like plato's cave which is what plato was you know the the matrix movies are a modern adaptation of plato's cave basically so so what can we do with this knowledge well this is where it comes down to staying with what matters most and developing a sense of discrimination where we discriminate between the trivial and what really matters most. The trivial is to be so consumed with consumerism, to be so distracted with cat videos on YouTube. I mean, hey, cat videos are fantastic. They're very interesting, or crocodile video, whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. It's at every moment, asking ourselves, who am I? This is a, just a recent podcast I did about self-inquiry. Who am I? Who are you? Who am I? And just going deep into that. And any answer that comes to you when you ask yourself that question, who am I? And you can ask yourself this question in a non-meditative state when you're doing whatever, when you've got a moment to pause and be in silence and just ask yourself, who am I? And it's any answer that comes to you from that intellect is not who you are. It's just not who you are. The, that's the identity. My name, my career, my nationality, my hobbies, my likes and dislikes, those are identity things. And modern consumerism has to do with identity enhancers you buy these things to feel better to, to or, you know the, the things that you don't really need um getting some new stuff buying a new stereo or a new tv or whatever they're identity enhancers a super sports car those are chick magnets but also they're identity <laughs> enhancers so uh 
that's what the modern world is offering. And I remember very clearly more than several times in, in the meditation retreats that I attended where the teacher said, because it was a recording of, uh, it was a recording that the teacher that was played of a teacher guiding you through the meditation process for 10 days, where he said near the end of it, he said, when you go out back into the world and you look at people, look closely at people, look really closely at people and you will see that most people are miserable. You ask any person, are you miserable? And they'll say, no, no, I'm pretty happy. But really, when you look at it, and if you can just stay with a person and dive into it, you'll see that every single person's got problems. Every single person's got concerns. And also, you'll notice that the people who haven't had many problems in their lives, you'll notice that they're not that interesting people. They're not that interesting people. That the most interesting people you'll meet are people who have gone through difficult situations. And it's like when I met a tree surgeon, I met this Dutch tree surgeon years ago. And I love meeting people from many different professions. And I asked people questions and just having a conversation with this guy. He was telling me that sometimes to make a tree grow, sometimes a tree will be stunted or a plant. And what you need to do is you need to stress it. You need to stress it a bit to make it grow. There are some, there are some, plants that will not blossom until they go through a cold spell. I learned that from my wife. She She's a master gardener and knows a lot about all these different plants. So it seems like that's what's happening, especially now to humanity in the 21st century or whatever, you know, the year 2017. And it's been so intense for humanity. But at the same time, you have the internet growing, you have humanity becoming more aware that we are much more than where we think we are, that these boundaries between nations are artificially made, that the, prog the cultural programming that happens in each culture are quite limiting, quite of a handicap shackles basically and i'm not an anarchist please don't get me wrong i'm not an anarchist at all i'm much more about i'm much more about and have from having traveled in so many different cultures and lived deeply in so many different cultures that every culture has these constricting limiting belief systems and they are like a cultural ego that form the legal, little egos in each person. And they are blinding, they are restrictive. And what is the true reality from the ancients, which is the ancient culture's deep wisdom aspect of this podcast, is that every single person, without exception, and I know this from personal experience, every single person without exception has incredible greatness within them. It's what, I'm not a Christian, like I said, I was born as an atheist, I'm not a, but it's what Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within. I'm not even sure, please forgive me, I'm, I'm not even sure if Jesus was the one who said that, but, or if it's um, just said in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven, excuse me, is within. The kingdom of heaven is within. Wow. Wow. That's, that's quite an open secret put out there. So why hasn't the modern church or the Vatican put that on its front lines of its teachings? Because if you become aware that the kingdom of heaven is within, then you don't need a, a middleman. You don't need the priest. You don't need the go-between between you and the divine with you and God, whatever you want to call it. So, but the kingdom of heaven is within. And the self-inquiry also, you're asking yourself, who am I? And the answer, according to the ancients, is just like what was in the Bible. I am that I am. There you go. So, you might... 
completely disagree with this. You might find this offensive if you're a religious person, but please, no disrespect whatsoever meant. It's just about the human condition and what we're made up of and the potential of each person to realize their true inner greatness and it's done in silence. Recently, I found an article and I posted it on my Facebook wall and it was about, it said five reasons why you have not discovered your life purpose. I don't remember four of the reasons, but I remember one of the reasons and it said, you hate silence. Well, that's, in ancient India, they said you cannot gain wisdom until you can be by yourself in silence. So, and look at the modern world. There's noise everywhere you go. There's background music in an elevator. There's background music in a department store. There's, there's distractions constantly. And that's why you constantly see people checking their social media 150 times per day. You know, it's a new phenomena called fubbing. P-H-U-B-B-I-N-G. So, I mean, look at, look at what's happening. So from this podcast, I hope you get inspired to not just use the word deep, <laughs> but to have a sense that there's much more to who you are than you realize, that you have incredible greatness within you, and to realize that it's only the ego, only the ego which is causing you problems. So you can see, like I've mentioned this so many times, there's a little video on YouTube, it's called Revolver Ego Scene. It's one minute and 42 seconds long, and it's from the end of a brilliant film by Guy Ritchie called Revolver, where a group of people are describing the ego and how it's the only real enemy. Well, there's an Upanishad um, story about King Janaka. Um, and he was, when he, the, the story is that when he woke up, meaning when he transcended his ego, he said, now I know who the thief is who's been stealing my life from me this whole time. So he was talking about the ego, stealing our lives from us. And the only thing we can do to have real freedom is to transcend our egos. And the, the irony of it is, the paradox of it is that it's important to become aware of this, but to not make too much of an effort with this, because then we start feeding the spiritual ego. But anyways, that's enough of this. I hope that you get inspired to explore your reality from this podcast and have a wonderful day. May the force be with you. May you be inspired with whatever you find inspiring, with whatever is your path, your own crooked path. Be true to your crooked path. It is the only path to walk on because it is completely, uniquely, personally, 100% you. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Goodbye.